I want to welcome all of you to the 51st annual Joseph Wharton Awards celebration. And I particularly want to welcome you back to the second year in a row that we have been able to do it in person. I sensed at the cocktail reception, which I hope you all enjoyed, a sense of energy that somehow I do not get on Zoom calls or text messages or email. Uh, any of you share that feeling, just being nice, being with such interesting, exciting other people? If so, just give me a signal. Now, now, I particularly want to thank you all and tell you one really good element that all of you have in common tonight. I am the only person in this room who cannot fall asleep while the MC is talking. <laughs> and I think you've already discovered that might be very easy. But I also want to congratulate all the people in the room because so many of you come from distinguished backgrounds in addition to our past and current honorees. In fact, I was counting, and I think we have more MDs and PhDs here tonight that they have on the GW faculty tonight. I'm not going to talk about Monday during the day, but at night. We definitely have a lot of doctors, so, but all stay well. It's a better way to do things. So with that said, I want to let you all see a little video, give you some perspective on where we've come recently and where we may be headed and some of the special attributes of the people we are fortunate to be honoring tonight. That is something all of our honorees have in common. I want to also give a special shout out to our past honorees. If all of you would stand, Wade Tetsuka, Jack Evans, Betsy Glick, and who else? I can't see. It's and Edmund Green. 
Yeah, it's very difficult seeing. I, I just wouldn't make it on uh, mainstream media if there is such a thing anymore. And by the way, um, it's also great. Um, I, I came fully prepared tonight. I'm giving new meaning that the Boy Scouts never intended because I have red and blue masks like tens colors, right? So, um, so one of the things all of these people have done is raise giving back to new meaning, to new level, helping others who need help, whether it's in a nonprofit, as some of them have done, whether it's in a, uh, an academic institution, it's in the business world providing needed financing for what might perhaps be the next Tesla or Google or Alphabet or whatever they're calling it, Alphabet soup these days. Uh, so it's really amazing, and that's part of what we've done with the Innovation Summit. So I particularly want to recognize, before we go to the honorees, the people here tonight who spend a major part of their time, other than the honorees, with nonprofits, such as Joyal Malparan, who helps people get through bereavement. We also have a young lady from the March of Dimes, Debbie Slaughter and others. If you would all stand, whether I mention your name or not, if you're working for a nonprofit helping others, just stand and let's give them all a round of applause. So now, I want all the honorees to stand. And all their designate. You see, we're taking after the Academy Awards, the Oscars, but we're not getting into politics. No. Who in the world will get into politics in Washington, D.C.? <laughs> uh, that, that would be utterly uh, crazy. So um, we are keeping it apolitical, but all of them are really phenomenal individuals. I just want them all to stand, and we will be able to recognize them. Uh, particularly if you see your pictures on the program, you will recognize them, what they look like. But we also have three who are here instead of others because they're off doing their next picture. Actually, one of them is doing a picture on his own. But I want all the honorees to stand, and we will announce you all in just a few minutes. And let's give them all a big round of applause. And now, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy your dinners. Time for the awards. And I will not ask for the envelope, please. I already know. We all know who's, who's, who is going to win awards. The first one is a special a person who's been a big part of this club for many years, who is an inventor, who has a number of patents, has written books, has connected morality to business practices. Um, he couldn't do that in the legal field because we know legal ethics is an oxymoron. I'm a lawyer, so I can say that. <laughs> you know, or like, what do you call 100 lawyers at the bottom of the public? A good start. <laughs> so you can groan. You can groan. I will not pick on any other uh, profession. Um, but but uh, he's, he has done a lot. He did this all while helping to raise a family with six girls. Very, very outnumbered. And he is in Panama now. So, as in the Academy Award, accepting the award in his place is his daughter, Catherine Orsini. Ladies and gentlemen. It's a long walk up, so. <laughs> so, Catherine. Okay, thank you. Do I say something? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, so I'm here receiving this award on behalf of my father, and uh, as a true Wharton grad, he thoroughly prepared me with a very detailed speech. As his daughter, I had the privilege of editing it. So, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, from a space of gratitude, he is in deep appreciation to the Wharton School, the Wharton Club of DC, and in particular to the Wharton President, Alan Schlafer. Uh, my father graduated from Wharton with a PhD and a master in MBA. 
first the MBA, um, and still recounts his many fond memories, successes, and struggles, and constantly talks about how this helped him open up many doors of opportunity, which I'm sure all of you have benefit, benef benefited from as well. Um, he started his involvement with the Warren Club uh, in uh, DC back before 2000. A few of his highlights were as chairman during the 2000 summit, meeting various politicians uh, from the foreign embassy events that Allen coordinated, such as Senator Bob Dole, uh, Dr. Ben Carson, and the Prince of Monte Carlo, um, as well as hearing from the grandniece of Thomas Edison speak on innovation. All this was possible by the commitment and diligence of one very specific person, Alan Schlafer. He has devoted so much of his time, energy, and effort into growing this organization that you see in front of you today. With his expansive network, he has gained entry into many exclusive venues for the memberships to ex the members to experience. His coordinated volunteer, he's coordinated volunteers' budgets and the minute details with military precision. And finally, I told you I edited this. There were like three more paragraphs. He sent his appreciation. He sends his appreciation and thanks to all of you here, and a little bit less to those who couldn't make it, as your participation, <laughs> commitment to the club, and Wharton pride is what has made tonight and future nights possible. And oh, right here in the end, he actually mentions me. So, and thanks to my dear daughter, <laughs> Catherine, for accepting this award on behalf of him, because he didn't mention us anywhere else. So, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your gracious comments, and I know John Francois is very proud of uh, Catherine and all, all her sisters and all his grandchildren. Uh, I understand there are a lot of frequent fire points that are going to be coming up going to and from Panama, and he will have special hats made for that each occasion, I'm sure. So next we turn to our Wharton Award recipients. Now. It's always a challenge to find people who merit the award, and uh, it's a nice challenge. And tonight, we have our, our first honoree, someone who has done a lot to help those who are not always able to help themselves. You've all heard of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, but probably most of us, unless we've had our own experience or with a family member, don't realize how many people are dealing with the challenges of a disability, whether mental or physical or whatever. We need a champion. And the, we are honoring one of those champions tonight with our Joseph Wharton Award. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to the stage to Kim, Kim Greenfield Alfonso. So first of all, I would like to thank the Wharton Club, Alan Schaefer, and Tony Cancellosi for this award. I'm humbled and I was very surprised. Second, I would like to thank my family and friends who are here to support me. Thank you for all of your love and the support you've given me throughout the many, many years. Love you guys. A special thank to, to my husband, Pedro Alfonso, who's right there, for enabling me to really um, focus on my passion and my mission. Without him, I would not be here today. He allowed me to focus my passion into the nonprofit world and now into my business. I love you. I'd like to also thank Councilmember Jack Evans for being here today and supporting me for this award as well. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank my daughter Alexandra, who is not here today. She is at Catholic University. 
She is rocking a 3.84 GPA <laughs> and is president of her sorority, my sorority, Delta Sigma Theta at Catholic University. And I won't say this to her, but she might be one of the first um, who is visually impaired serving as president. Uh, but she would not want to hear that because she does not look through those lens. Our daughter was born with Peter's anomaly and that resulted in her being visually impaired, a braille reader, and a cane traveler. As most parents, I became her best advocate, as most of us parents would be, and personally experienced what life was like through her lens as living with a person with a disability in a world that was often not accessible nor inclusive. In the spirit of diversity and inclusion, and with the advent of COVID, digital accessibility is now more relevant than ever with over 61 million people living with a disability, which is 26% of our population. When I do my accessibility trainings, I often start them by asking a question. I ask them to imagine what would it be like if you could not order a meal through Uber Eats, you couldn't order your groceries through Instacart, you couldn't pay a bill online, you couldn't order the movie that you wanted to order, you couldn't apply for a job online, or you just don't feel included or that you belong. This is what many people with disabilities face. They feel excluded and left out as though the world is close to them. So my passion is my mission, and my mission is to create a world that is accessible and inclusive for everyone, so that everyone is all in, including people with disabilities. So my call for you today is to do your part in moving our community towards an accessible and inclusive world so everyone, including with people with disabilities, are all in. This could start simply by making sure your website is accessible to people with disabilities. So again, I want to thank everyone here today for coming. Again, thank you, Alan Schaefer, for this um, opportunity and this award, and have a great evening. Thank you. What a champion, uh, and I'm sure it's very satisfying turning those who are deemed turning those who are deemed disabled into those who are enabled to enjoy some of the blessings that so many of us take for granted. And uh, just on that note, we have had two, at least two other people, one of whom is present tonight, who's dealt with hearing issues and and. We can hear you loud and clear, a brilliant communicator. And uh, a few years ago also, a gentleman who was riding his bike from New Jersey up into New York and back to his home in New Jersey when he was hit by an SUV and became paraplegic and has now helps people get the home health care they need. So sometimes, I mean, I think it takes tremendous courage to get, work through those things. So thanks to all of them and to everybody who supports the people who are doing that very difficult, challenging, and important job. We now turn to a different area of uh, human existence and lives of people here and elsewhere. And that is not is, is trying to find the right place where your talent can be used. Talent was the theme of the Wharton Global Forum in Paris at the famous uh, Westin Vendome back in 2013, 2013, if you want to speak the French. Um, but it was a fabulous conference speaking, featuring among other things, a three-star French chef who had the wonderful first name Evelyn like Alain, uh, Alain Ducasse, who has more stars than any other French chef. Oh, mais oui. 
but this was incredible because talent is going to be one of the determinants of who succeeds, who doesn't, which organizations thrive, which ones fade away. Look back to Fortune 500 20, 30, 40 years ago. A lot of those companies are not in existence anymore. Or go back 100 years. All the car companies that went out of existence, among other things, the steel companies, et cetera. So talent is one of those key determinants. And tonight, we have somebody who, who deals with talent and helps match people looking for talent with the people who have the talent to give. Ladies and gentlemen, let's cut to the chase, Mr. Andrew Chase, yeah. Justin Bradley. Okay, so I don't get to do any chase jokes, I guess, now. Um, I would like to thank uh, Alan and the uh, Wharton Club. Uh, I first got involved at the club about 20 years ago, uh, just when we were starting our business. And, uh, and shortly after that, I met uh, another member of the club, and it may have been at, at one of the innovation conferences. And a short while after that, uh, my CEO, uh, Beth Monroe, uh, placed that person as CFO of a nonprofit in Africa. Uh, so uh, uh, the Wharton Club's been very good to us, and it's been uh, very good to some of our candidates and clients as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, when I was in sixth grade, um, I took first place in a dance contest. Um, it's true. Um, so uh, anyone who knows me now knows that that recognition didn't age very well. So well, uh, hopefully this one will age a little bit better. Um, so Justin Bradley is, uh, is the company I work at. Uh, we're a finance and accounting search and staffing firm. Um, I think most of you know what a search firm is, and you can think of other words for search firm, but uh, we place people uh, around the D.C. area and around the country on finance, accounting, and other business professional jobs. Um, it's our 20th anniversary, as I mentioned, so that's a big milestone for us. Um, the thing, uh, a lot of people don't know about the inside workings of a search firm, though, and a lot of it seems kind of easy. but. Uh, we kind of have two sets of clients. So all our, our search consultants work with uh, the clients, the hiring manager, and they work with the uh, candidates we place. And, and you all know what working with people is like. So uh, they get it at both ends. But I'll tell you, I think they would be extraordinary diplomats because they are just, uh, the people I work with are terrific. So let me, um, so much talking about the company, let me just introduce uh, some of my colleagues who are here today, uh, uh, Beth Monroe is our CEO and the uh, visionary of, of starting up the firm. Um, uh, Christy uh, Andrus, a vice president and a co-founder of the firm. And uh, Christina <laughs> Preacher-Charn, who's, <laughs> she lost the bet, I did get the name right. Um, is our business development manager. And she's relatively uh, new with the firm, but uh, she's going to be here for a while, and she's off to a great start. Uh, well, enough about the firm. And um, you know, Kim, who was up here before, is, is really a, a tough honor to follow. Uh, is very impressed with your passion and the, and the things that you do. Uh, if anything, it'll probably make this, I'll make this a little bit easier for the uh, following honorees to, <laughs> to come up. <laughs> uh, I've had a, a kind of an unconventional career path, as I've mentioned to a few people. Um, it's not the kind you plan ahead. Uh, it just kind of happens in a way. I started off as, a, as an engineer, and then I was uh, uh, in management consulting. 
And uh, now I'm an executive at a search and staffing firm. So I can't think of three more different places to be, but uh, I, I kind of found the place that I was meant to be, I think. Um, and uh, I didn't know what I was bringing to the firm when we started, and, I, and I'm kind of going in this direction because I've been out there listening to people up here in the past, and uh, I pretty much dismissed the possibility of being up here after all the impressive people that have been here. Uh, but I didn't bring a, I didn't bring experience in, in staffing or search when I got here, and I didn't know, uh, I didn't know what I was bringing. But then I kind of figured out that I knew how to figure stuff out, and and the advantage of being able to figure stuff out is you can then figure out stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, it's funny, but it worked for me, <laughs> um, and. Uh, when I got to, I think uh, uh, when I got to Wharton, uh, it kind of it kind of hit me. Um, uh, I got there, and uh, one of my courses, great course, I, I remember it. It was uh, entrepreneurship in the real estate development process. Uh, it sounds terrible. Great professor, and you'd go in there on a Monday, and you get a packet about an inch thick a paper about a, a real estate development project somewhere in the Philadelphia area. And the instructions were, next week give a presentation. On what? On something in the packet of papers we gave you. That was it. And uh, it's a little fearful at first, but uh, boy, I really liked that whole thing. It was terrific. And then you'd go meet with the uh, principals in the real estate uh, uh, development project, and it was kind of like the real world. And it was, uh, it was just kind of figuring out, figuring out stuff. And, uh, and again, the, the point of this is there are a lot of people that plan their career from the beginning, um, and it works out for them. But there's also a path for those of us, however you want to measure your success, to just figure it out along the way. Um, so uh, I guess the last thing I want to say, uh, the, the question is, is, is this a big deal? Can I take some of your minutes here? <laughs> okay. okay. Um, all I can say is uh, my mom would be very proud. Thank you. Andy, thank you very much. Um, they're very touching. <laughs> to see how moved you are. As I said, we would cut to the chase. I also would say, in a sense, uh, the theme is sometimes find a niche and scratch it. And sometimes you find one niche, and then you find another, and you go on, and it makes life more interesting. I say that both seriously and tongue your cheek. And, uh, you know, I displayed at the beginning some of the characteristics of the people uh, and uh, who are being honored. You know, creativity, adaptability, certainly you've described. Um, our next person has a really amazing background, and we don't have a relative scale that you're a 10. Everybody here tonight is, is a 10. There is no other rating or you wouldn't be here. But some people, here's somebody else who has been in different sectors, the private sector dealing with inventions and helping with e-readers and especially the connectivity, e-readers for people who use Braille. So private, academic, uh, uh, non-governmental, variety of things. And um, about a year ago, we had a special program because I stopped. Who, who here has heard of Indiana, Pennsylvania? Anybody? Okay, so which very famous person is from Indiana, Pennsylvania? Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart is correct. 
And I stopped there last year on a trip through Pennsylvania and uh, went to the Jimmy Stewart Museum. And it was just fabulous. It is a gem. A gem, not a gem, a gem <laughs> right across the street from the hardware store where the Stewart family used to operate. And he went to a lesser Ivy League school known as Princeton, but we won't hold that against him. One of the great movie stars, great American uh, in, in drama, in civic duty as in his military career. Probably his most famous movie would have to be It's a Wonderful Life. And that happens to be the favorite movie of tonight's next honoree, Dr. Victor McCrary. So let us hear what he has to say about his wonderful life. Victor. First of all, uh, I, I want to first of all th give thanks to all of you coming out and especially to the Wharton Club of D.C., to, to Alan Schaffler, Elvie Barreling, and Justine Schaffner for all you do and the team that you have done to make this happen. So, you know, as Alan has inferred, um, I'm a person of the movies and It's a Wonderful Life was one of my most favorite movies, especially this time of year. And Jimmy Stewart in his role as George Bailey was something. And so when you think about George Bailey or you think about any of us, it's, you know, what makes a person is institutions we've been blessed to have been affiliated. So if you look at the screen, I want to start with the Army because my mom and dad were both Army folks. They met in the 50s. They were an interracial couple. They got married. That's why I guess I'm here. And, um, <laughs> and, 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 and then, you know, I went to D.C. public schools and the archdiocesan schools for my education because they really pressed that. Uh, I went to a place called DeMatha, which is out in Hyattsville, and my calculus teacher is here, Rocco Manella, and his wonderful wife, uh, Jane Hamill. <laughs> and then my, one of my colleagues, Tom Gallus, who I went to school with would be celebrating 50 years next year. So it's really important about those, 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 those institutions. And then I went to Catholic and then Howard University. I heard some Howard go bison, you know. But I also have to point out two best friends, Albert Paul, Reggie Gallimore, and his beautiful wife, Rachel. Um, helped me get through. We were all in graduate school. And graduate school is like a house of cards. You know, if you don't finish, you don't know what's going to happen. And so they have been instrumental in my life. And I want to say I love them and thank them for what they do. They got me there. You know, I then, you know, went on to work at, at, at Bell Labs and then NIST. And let me tell you something about NIST. You know, I don't know about all of you all, but you can count on probably your hand with a few fingers left the number of bosses you have that are pretty good. And I had, you know, one really great boss, and that was Dean Collins, and he's here today, and I just want to thank him for his friendship and mentorship and all he did. And then things like Nobuche and, 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 and Johns Hopkins and, and Bea and, and, and Morgan, and I want to say Tim, Tim Akers, who I worked with at Morgan, and his colleagues done a fran fantastic job, you know, and then my, you know, my parish at, at, at St. John's and then NSF and NSB and Sean Jones, who I think is here. I want to just thank you for, for all you do. Now, you notice in this, I, I didn't mention UDC because I wanted to hold that for last because that's where I'm at now. And if you look at It's a Wonderful Life, UDC is the Bailey Brothers building and loan. <laughs> we are the ones who give the loans or opportunity to people who are denied by everybody else. And it has been a fantastic place. I want to really thank President Ron Mason for what he's done. 
and my colleagues, particularly Laura Lee Davison, who's out here in the office. I want to thank her for what she has done. Um, because if you look at that movie, you know, we, you have to be crazy to do what the things we're doing because we're going against a model to really uplift those students and empower them. And if you're really thinking about UDC and you want to help us, Rodney Trapp, our Vice President for Advancement, he's right there, so go see him af afterward. So in my next slide, please, I just want to say that the most important thing is, is, is family. Family has been really important. Oh, oh go back. And, and you know, my, in the middle, is, I just want to give thanks to my daughter, Francesca. No, oh, go back. It's my, my son-in-law, Raphael, my son, Max, and his wife, Hannah. And all the people, go back, uh, who, have, who have been really there. I just want to show you in the corners, upper right and left, is my mom and dad. And, and, and you know, I, I think being a son of an interracial family, it was all about how do we build bridges against all, about all our communities and how we make this. And so finally, now you can go to the next slide. Um, like George Bailey, he went through a rough time if you watch the movie. But there was a few things that he could count on. And that was God, that was guardian angel, but most important was his wife who was prayed by Donna Reed. But I want to say this award that I have today, I want to dedicate it to my wife, Mercedes. She is the worst person who is, for 32 years, who's put up with my stubbornness, my crazy ideas, bore two beautiful children, um, has helped me make sure I get the right tie to wear tonight, make sure I show up on time. Um, she is everything that, as Donna Reed was, to George Bailey in that movie. And so I want to dedicate it to my wife, Mercedes. I think I got that correct in terms of pronunciation. And I want to say, you know, um, if you have a chance, remember that, you know, it is a wonderful life. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, folks. We need. Uh, boy, that's a that's a hard one to follow. <laughs> It's like when I took some of the courses at Penn, I had the same feeling. But this was in a, a much better way. Uh, we heard the name Bailey. So I have, uh, we're going to give away two books tonight. The first book uh, it, it takes the name of Bailey. And uh, I want to find out from somebody here, you're pretty astute, know a lot about business, real estate, etc. Uh, uh, what is and you can't look it up on Google, Bailey's Crossroads. Who is the Bailey in Bailey's Crossroads? Bailey's Crossroads, the person who became part of Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. So uh, I will have to try another question later. I got two books to give away. But uh, truly having purpose and wonderful life, and I would say do see Jimmy Stewart movies, a wonderful book about him, which I read, and just a fabulous, uh, fabulous museum. And we try to bring some of those things through the Wharton Club, and I'm also the uh, program and speaker's chair for the Rotary Club of Bethesda Chevy Chase, and I want one of our special guests, Ed Pratt, if I... If you could say, Ed is also, Ed is, is president of the Manassas Rotary Club. Ed, if you would stand, and anybody else in Rotary or Kiwanis or any other big service organization, stand and give Ed a big hand. So, now we will go back to the main order of business. I'm going to have to come up with some easier questions. I got two. I got two. 
But it, I think it's just fascinating about that. I'm going to ask you about another name you've all heard, I guarantee, and see if you know what the derivation is. It's a repeat of a prior question. So we have the Wharton Award Dinner Aptitude Test. We will continue later. Meanwhile, it's time for our next award. Uh, unfortunately, I guess could not be here. She was on the West Coast, uh, not feeling well, could not travel east. And she ha is, is a publisher, a best-selling author, inspiring speaker, talent innovation specialist, and runs a company called Diversity Woman Media. Uh, books lead by example. And she has a Master of Education, Chief Learning Officer, and Doctor of Education from the University of Pennsylvania. For Dr. Sheila Robinson, and we have somebody else accepting the award on her behalf. I would ask you if you could come up here now. Debbie Slaughter with March of Dimes. Oh, okay. Have to, yes. Have to, so, 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 so. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I actually can't see anyone, but uh, good evening, everyone. And I am here on behalf of Sheila, and I call her Sheila and not Dr. Robinson, because Sheila is a wonderful friend uh, to me, and she's a wonderful person. And I actually met Sheila when uh, I worked at Fannie Mae as the Chief Diversity Officer. And she had just started her business. And I got a call that she was starting a diversity woman conference. And I thought, I will give you money. Yes, I will give you money. <laughs> I had money then to do, to do that. And so for all of the years that Sheila has been in business with Diversity Woman Conference, as well as the Inclusion Magazine, uh, she has been so generous in her time, in her leadership, to so many women who are in the diversity field. So today, I'm the Chief Diversity Officer at March of Dimes, and Sheila has a magazine called Inclusion Magazine, and she made me a cover girl. So she's a, she's a BFF forever, 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 right? And I, I'll tell you a story. Uh, when she put me on the cover of the magazine, she said, uh, how many copies do you want? And I thought, well, 10. You know, I'll give one to my mom and to my brothers and, you know, just to families. And I got a box of 300 magazines <laughs> from Sheila, and I'm still giving away 300 magazines <laughs> everywhere I go. But, you know, the, the conversation that you have about um, when you're not invited to the table, uh, what do you do? You create your own. And Sheila has absolutely created her own table. Um, and she has opened it up for women all across this country uh, to have a voice, to have a seat at the table, to know that those of us who do the work in diversity, equity, and inclusion have a tall order and a purpose um, to change the world. And so I am grateful for standing here for Sheila to accept this award. And she called me tonight and she said, I can't make it, but this will be a great date night for you. So I I appreciate being here, and I am honored to accept this award on her behalf. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Darlene. Uh, so I'm going to give you a really easy question now, just to see if you've been paying attention and see your knowledge of. U.S. presidents having nothing to do with Penn or any university. Which president is the only one to have received a patent? No. Yes, who said Abraham Lincoln? Chuck Schilke? You get Jeff Bezos. Here, you can come up, Chuck. Invent and wander. So if you have some wanderlust or other lust, we will leave off the table. Chuck? What was the 
No, it's a, it's a book by Jeff Bezos. I think you've all heard of him. Uh, we did not order this from Amazon. No, we did order it from Amazon, of course. Thank you. Pardon me? What was the patent for? The patent was for a board to a boat to ford uh, uh, in, in rivers. Um, and some people might have thought it was patently absurd, but it was. <laughs> okay. I'll have two more questions, so if you miss on one, you'll have another chance. So, our next honoree. You know, Wharton is used to be called the Wharton School of Finance and Commerce. Now it's known as the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, but Wharton Business School. Wharton is inextricably tied with money, and money that makes things happen, that makes businesses go, that propel innovation, that power our enterprises. And unfortunately, another person who was not feeling well um, and had the good grace not to come in, but unfortunately, I mean, an extremely talented individual whose company, Sing Capital Partners, multifamily office that directs investments into venture capital, real estate, and growth equity, and uh, one of the youngest CFA charter holders in the world, serves on numerous companies, um, went to Maryland Smith School undergrad, and got his MBA from Wharton in entrepreneurship, finance and real estate, and one of his brothers is here to receive the award on his behalf. So, time for Singh to have its moment of glory. My name is Gurpreet Singh. I'm Manpreet's brother, his older brother. Um, unfortunately, he didn't prepare me with a nice speech like one of our other guests earlier. So I'm going to wing it and make sure we uh, end this thing on schedule. So I'll keep it quick. Um, but given all the stories about Warden and the Warden Club, I did want to mention that I think it had a pivotal uh, role in Manpreet's uh, career. I remember that his uh, love for finance and money began back when he started his first er internship when he was 18. Um, but I think he met lots of friends and colleagues at the Wharton School in 2007, 8, and 9, and saw his friends build firms um, from the ground up. And I think that gave him the courage to finally start his own uh, almost 10 years after graduating. And so in 2019, Singh Capital was born. Um, it focuses on making investments across a wide variety of uh, asset classes, I guess you could say, but they, they focus on diversity. They try to create more opportunities um, in a diverse way in terms of opportunities as well as capital. So whether it's uh, joining the firm or deploying capital or even maybe how companies partner with one another, it tries to enable diversity as much as, I can, as it can. Um, I'm sure Mapri wants to thank his family, his girls, his wife, his parents, uh, me, of course, his only brother. <laughs> and um, and um, so he thanks all of them. He also wants to thank uh, the Wharton University, the Wharton Club of DC, uh, Alan, of course, and uh, everyone else who came to attend the event. Um, and uh, with that, I'll thank everyone. Thank you. Just a little quick side note, because I'm going to tell you all something may surprise you, but I feel so inspired by what Tim has done and what some of the others. And uh, sometimes you have something that's not necessarily considered a disability, but a, lot, a lack of comfort. The first time I got up in front of an audience, junior high school, my legs were shaking. Really. I didn't know what to say. I, I, I was running for student council president. I was so awkward. I didn't even vote for myself. I mean, 
what kind of a loser? <laughs> But there's a Warden connection to all this because in my junior year I met a guy who was working for Procter & Gamble and he was in the same building. He was in a regular apartment. I was sharing a two-bedroom place over a garage. Really fancy. $70 a month. Oh, $5 for utilities per month. And it's still there. It hasn't been torn down. That That's totally amazing. But thanks to his coaching, I got on track, and I certainly recommend getting coaching where you need it. Now, one of my greatest pleasures is running this club with running events that will attract all of you and others that will enlighten people, stimulate them, make them have fun. And now, about the only shaking I love to hear is when I hear hands clapping or shaking, whether it's for, you know, for me or for somebody else, to make somebody laugh, to make them feel, to make them think. And uh, that's just my true confession of the evening. And I would say everybody can do it, because it's, it's not something you're naturally born with. So many of us have to learn so many things in life, whether you go to Wharton or Penn or anywhere else. We all have to go through that very tough place known as the School of Hard Knocks. So enough of that. I'm going to give you all another. Well, I think I'll wait until after the next speaker, because he's got an amazing story, too. And then we're going to give away the second book, which is How to Invest by David Rubenstein. Really phenomenal. And I want to thank Wade Tetsuka for inviting Justine, me, and Roe on to our program where David spoke about the book. He was interviewed. So our, our final honoree is helping those, and has for 40 years, has helped hundreds of thousands of veterans. Now, veterans put their lives on their line, whether it's during wartime or peace. Uh, so many of them went ac across the ocean to fight in World War I, or World War II, either the Atlantic or Pacific, or were at home. And they put their lives on the line. Many of them don't come back. Those who do are often severely injured. They have all sorts of problems, and to them, we all owe a great debt. They're the general commanding the efforts on their behalf, in and out of the courtroom, uh, is here with us tonight. He has written a Bible to guide those who want to help those troops, the men and women, again, who put their lives on the line. 2,200 pages, 2,200 pages, which can be read, can be used for guidance. Um, if I had it, um, that would, would probably be for weightlifting, but that's a different matter. But seriously, Old Testament, New Testament, this is Bart's Testament. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give a really big round of applause for our final re honoree, Bart Stitchman. especially pleased to receive this award because of the role my life at Penn played in my becoming an advocate for veterans. While I was at Penn, the Vietnam War was raging. My classmates and I had to ponder what to do uh, after our college deferments ended about the possibility that we would be drafted. Back then, many of you will recall that Ho Chi Minh led the Viet Cong to fight uh, from North Vietnam in a fight against uh, the South Vietnamese government backed by the United States. I had heard back at Penn that President Eisenhower wrote a book 
after he left the presidency that said the U.S. had unilaterally canceled the 1954 presidential elections required by the treaty that the U.S. had signed with many other nations um, and uh, he, he, it was because President Eisenhower knew that Ho Chi Minh would have won the election if it had been held. So I had trouble believing this and I went to Rosengarten Library, which many of you who attended Penn know, the undergraduate library, to look for that book, Mandate for Change. And I remember to this day going to the library, finding the book, and opening it up. And on page 374, it said exactly that, that the US had canceled the elections unilaterally because Eisenhower knew that Ho Chi Minh would have won what he estimated was 80% of the votes of the Vietnamese. So the US canceled the election, which of course violated the treaty. That was it for me. I joined many of my fellow Penn students in opposition to the war. But when I graduated, I wasn't one of those drafted. Instead, hundreds of thousands of young Americans like me were sent to Vietnam, fought in that war, and returned scarred and maimed. So after I graduated law school, I jumped at the chance to work for a nonprofit organization to, re, to represent disabled Vietnam veterans, especially those with less than honorable discharges, in trying to get their discharges upgraded. And then after a few years, I co-founded an organization that I've been with for over 40 years, the National Veterans Legal Services Program, a nonprofit organization to represent veterans of all wars on all the different types of disabilities they suffered from. Post-traumatic stress disorder, many cancers that result from exposure to Agent Orange in Vietnam and other toxic exposures, uh, continuing with less than honorable discharges. We fought in Congress to repeal an unfair law that made veterans second-class citizens. Veterans, since 1932, couldn't file a lawsuit in federal court if the VA turned their benefits claim down. They were one of the few citizens who had a dispute with the government who couldn't go to court. And a corollary was an 1862 law that barred a veteran from paying a lawyer more than $10 as a fee to represent the veteran before the VA. So no lawyers could afford to practice. Veterans were represented by non-lawyers who had uh, hundreds of cases per person and so didn't get adequate representation. We fought those two laws for 12 years before Congress finally repealed them. Thank you. What I learned over 40 years of representing veterans is that very often our government doesn't keep its promise to care for those who served and came home with injuries and disabilities. Very sad, but true. Injuries due to their military service. Actually, it is because of our government's failure to follow the veterans' benefits laws that our organization has been so successful in getting courts to force the government to pay billions of dollars, $5.2 billion, in withheld benefits 
to veterans of all wars, Vietnam, the Persian Gulf Wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, they're just due. And that is the sad part of what we've had to fight. Uh, and so before I end, I wanted to uh, thank and uh, especially those who work with the National Veterans Legal Services Program and who are here tonight. There's Patty Briota, our communications director, and Stacy Trombel, our lead litigator, and Anna Reyes, uh, our development director, and Patricia Davis, who is my lifetime partner. Um, and thank you for coming. And so I thank Wharton for recognizing the importance of our work, that the National Veterans uh, Legal Services program, program and I have been engaging in that is so important. Thank you all. Moving words. Um, and thank you very much, Bart, for what all you, all you and your team have done to serve those who have served and given the, the what is considered the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, in my own case, I was actually very fortunate the day after the bar exam, I had to take the physical. And I was up till midnight. I had to get up at 4 a.m. and I thought, I better have a cup of coffee. I'm never going to stay awake for this damn thing. The coffee caused my blood pressure to go up to 165 or 115. <laughs> Two subsequent readings, one why. Uh, uh, a lot worse than I did on any of the tests or courses I took at Penn, that's for sure. But I have a more serious message for all of you, and that is to encourage you, following what Bart said, to uh, give extra honor to our, our veterans. You can do that in a number of ways. You'll find very moving, if you can. Go to the beaches of Normandy. They're absolutely amazing. What we were able to do under the guidance of the Supreme Allied Commander, Dwight David Eisenhower, whose, whose grandson uh, is or was at least on the faculty at Penn. It is a truly amazing experience. Go maybe to some of the World War I battlefield. See some of the movies, read some of the books, read about D-Day by Stephen Ambrose, who spoke at the press club on the 50th anniversary of D-Day back in 1994. But going to the beaches is uh, something you will all appreciate and remember. Or go to, to the D-Day uh, Museum in uh, Bedford, Virginia, where the Bedford boys who were in the first wave to hit on Mopah Beach came ashore. Uh, and read, and read about other wars. We are so fortunate. And whatever you think some, uh, most I would guess in this audience appreciate what's going now, on now in Ukraine, uh, amazing leader over there, Vladimir Zelensky. And what was he doing five or six years ago? The absolute truth, wouldn't believe it if you hadn't seen it. He was a star in a three-part series called Servant of the people. Oh, I should have asked that as a question. You probably wouldn't have gotten it. I could have kept the books. <laughs> Servant of the people, about a high school teacher who makes fun of politicians and then runs and wins. And uh, it's really amazing, so articulate, uh, leading his, his people. And I'm going to close with the words from somebody whose name, a president whose name was already mentioned, President Lincoln, in his first inaugural address at a time when we face great divides and we need to come together, each of us here and each of the people who isn't here tonight, to join together. We are truly blessed to be in this nation. Consider all of us, and even Native Americans, everybody came from somewhere else. You have ancestors who came. We are so blessed to be here in this country. and. Lincoln said in his first inaugural address, 
the mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. Moving words by one of the greatest presidents. So thank you for coming. And I want to give a final round of applause. But let's give a round of applause after we get to give away the last gift, how to invest. So you've all heard of Arby's, the fast food restaurant, right? What does Arby's stand for? And let me just tell you before you answer, there is a Wharton connection. I will tell you that. So what does Arby's stand for? No, no, it's not roast beef. That's what I thought, too. Arby's stands for Raffle Brothers. The Raffle Brothers were from Ohio. One went to Wharton, one went to the co hotel management school at Cornell. OK, last question. Uh, God. Make it easy. Um, actually, I will make it easy in one sense. You'll be amazed when I tell you what the answer is, because I doubt if anybody's going to get it, and I may have to. Uh, OK, there was a. Uh, a character appeared in that appeared in every MGM picture for many years after the company started and retired not in Hollywood but to Philadelphia what was identify that uh, that character what did I hear the lion who said the lion first he did okay correct wait who did Okay, we'll have to flip a coin. You guys are going to have to fight it out. Okay, the full answer is it was known as Leo the Lion, but it was actually Jackie. I didn't want to ask that because I know new, but you know. And where did Jackie retire? The Philadelphia Zoo, which was America's first zoo. Right. So, okay, I'll give it to one of you anyway. <laughs> What a tough audience. Okay, you guys have been great tonight. Thank you all so much for coming. Let's, let's, I'm going to ask you all to rise to an honor, a celebration of all of our honorees, all six of the Wharton Award winners, lifetime achievement, and to each of you for what you're doing to give us a better nation, a better world. Thank you all very much. If you would all just rise and honor. And all, I need all the awardees up here on, on stage.